Our guest today is Neil Fox, film producer and musician. He has a long list of credits, including being signed by three major labels, Polydor, RCA, and Columbia Records. His music has also been featured on CBS News with Dan Rather and won Cleo and Tully Awards. Today, Neil shares details on his eye-opening, fascinating socio-political musical documentary called The Conspiracy Project. Find out more about Neil at therealneilfox.com. Hi, Neil. Welcome to Savvy Business Radio for our Heartbeat of the World segment. And I'm so grateful to have you here. I think I told you before the interview that I came across your wonderful film, The Conspiracy Project, completely by accident. I just saw it on, on YouTube and I was like, hmm, what is this conspiracy thing? And I was a little intrigued, a little like, ah. Uh, but I was very happily surprised. I mean, you actually put together a very interesting topics with music and, and kind of like a little Broadway show going on in the background. You kind of inform people what's going on in the world. There's a lot of things going on, issues all over the world, and you're bringing them together into one beautiful 17-piece. Uh, I think there's 17 songs in, in the... Uh, yeah. Yeah, and they're amazing. But before we go to talking about all that, share with the audience a little bit about your background, how you came to um, writing this um, film. Well, uh, I was born in Brooklyn, <laughs> uh, which says it all. <laughs> no, actually, actually, I, I started, um, well, I wanted to be a cartoonist or an animator when I was five years old. I'll give you the short version because I've lived enough decades now to, for this to be a very long conversation. But uh, when I found out, you couldn't just draw one picture and make it move magically. You know, I was five years old. Uh, then I decided that wasn't for me. It was too much work. So at 14, uh, I, I was already playing music for about four years. Had my first gig at 14 playing at a uh, dance. Mm -hmm. And I was hooked. I was a musician from then on and uh, started writing songs at 15. Uh, usually songs with social commentary. Mm. Um, yeah, I, you know, or funny. I, I see I had like two things I would either do that or funny songs um, because there's kind of like at least two sides to me mm -hmm. and you know one side is very serious the other side it says all right let's lighten up you know this is getting crazy uh, at any rate so um, I went through college and high school I was a music major composition major and uh, I was just writing songs and recording with my own equipment at home and then finally got a recording contract mm -hmm. uh, with Polydor Records mm -hmm. And uh, that was a lot of fun. They sent us out from uh, New York to uh, California, and we recorded with, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of these guys, Hal Blaine, did you ever hear of him? Yeah. Uh, he's, he's the drummer on uh, every hit that came out of the 60s and 70s. Uh, Paul Simon, uh, Simon and Garfunkel, um, uh, gee, uh, what's the name? Uh, oh, I can't remember her name. Uh, anyway, every single hit, the monkeys, you know. Bridge Over Troubled Water. He was playing drums on the, on the cuts they sent us out there. So I worked with some great musicians. And uh, we got, we had one, one record that got to number 112 on Billboard charts. Mm -hmm. Wasn't too bad. Uh, then I, I got off that label and got on to, uh, got signed with Columbia Records, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, Clive Davis. Maybe you heard of his name. He's more famous. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. so he, he signed me up as a solo artist. Before that, I was uh, Mancini and Fox. That, mm. that was the name of the group. But now in Columbia, I, I uh, went on as a solo artist. And uh, unfortunately, the day they signed me to the contract, I saw an eyewitness news that they fired Clive Davis from Columbia Records. Whoa. So I was on Columbia for like, uh, everybody that wanted me on the label left with Clive. So I was there for like two and a half years with um, nothing happening, ah. you know, just a few demos. Um, then I played, so, I wanted to get out of my contract. So, and this is a true story. I played them some of my best songs, which were really a little bit strange. <laughs> uh -huh. So uh, I won't even mention the titles here because it's probably a family show. Okay. Uh, but uh, they instantly let me out of my contract. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, then I got signed to RCA Records shortly wow. after that. And I put a, put a band together and, um, uh, we uh, auditioned, not audition. we did, oh, you got a pooch. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. You kept talking, so I decided to bring him on up. <laughs> oh, that's cool. My wife does the same thing, but she's in another room. Um, anyway, so, <laughs> where was I? Oh, so we, we did a showcase at Tramps in Manhattan, which this is back in the 70s. And Sammy Kahn was there. He's like a famous songwriter. And uh, uh, the president of Fabergé was there and the president of RCA was there. Mm -hmm. And they were going to put us on the road. And then they fired the president of RCA. Uh -huh. So 
Where's a drummer when you need one? Oh, bummer. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I got off RCA and uh, I got into the jingle business. I'll make this a little quicker. Spent about 20 years with my own company, writing music for NBC and CBS and uh, did some co-scored the music to the Killer Tomatoes Strike Back and the Return of the Killer Tomatoes <laughs> and did music for Dan Rather, CBS Evening News. Uh, millions of commercials, millions. I mean, wow. that's a little <laughs> bit of a, a little bit of an overstatement, hundreds of commercials. Uh, and anyway, I finally got out of the jingle business because I just didn't like it at all. Uh, I'm putting that mildly. <laughs> and um, decided to start my own record company and I did that and uh, uh, very quickly went, uh, found out what poverty is like, you know? It's just not, it, the whole record industry was changing right at that point, so we, they were going digital. And nobody was spending money on records anymore because they were getting free. Um, but at that point I figured, well, I still got money coming in from Dan Rather, let me just do what I love to do. Um, you know, whether it makes money or not, who cares, you know? So I created a one man show called Pigeonholes, which people Ooh. could find on Amazon, which, uh, I performed it in uh, Hollywood, California, and San Diego, and uh, it went over incredibly well. Luckily, we filmed it, so I have it on a DVD, mm. and uh, after that, did another one-man show. They fired Dan Rather, so there went that income, and all of a sudden, I really found out what poverty was. Uh, <laughs> so at that point, you know, I was starting, I'm not really a political type guy. I really... I really hated politics and I still do. <laughs> I get you. <laughs> yeah. But it really bothers me. I mean, the idea of slavery bothers me a lot. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't just mean what uh, black people went through or what the Jews went through 3,000, 5,000 years ago, whatever that was. I'm talking about every day, every man, slavery, all of us. You have a small group of elites mm -hmm. and then you have the rest of the people. And Basically, what I was finding out is they want everybody to be slaves. Yeah. You know, they want us unhealthy. They want us uh, in poverty. Um, and I started looking more and more into it. what's doing that, you know. And so I, I read a 700-page book about the Federal Reserve. Mm. Uh, and then uh, the first thing I did from that point, I, I mean, I really got angry. When, when you find out what the Federal Reserve is, number one, it's not federal. Number two, there's no reserves. Uh, it's it's the biggest ripoff scam, uh, and that is what's ruining America for the most part. Mm -hmm. The Federal Reserve, uh, it's just a bunch of private bankers, and they tricked us into giving them the power yeah. to print money for us. You wrote that in one of my favorite songs in your in your album. F say it. <laughs> F the Fed, which I can't say the the full word because. Yeah. Uh, this is going to go to radio, but yeah, it's a fabulous song. And the history, we had someone on last year who actually wrote a book on the Federal Reserve and you, you put it into your song. So if people don't like to read big books. They can check out your song and get a brief history on how the Federal Reserve came to be and got signed and, and all mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I did at that point. See my, the thing that I was always good at was taking a serious subject and putting it in a way that was, it made it easy to go down, you know, using entertainment, even using comedy and uh, whatever. I mean, just wanted to put it in a way that people would understand because, frankly, the whole key to staying free is knowledge. You know, if, yeah. if enough people know what's going on, they can't get away with it. Yes, you know, the, the bad guys. Yeah. So that's why I came up with that. F the Fed song, and I put that up first on YouTube, and it took off. Yeah, uh, people loved it. You know, probably if I said "end the Fed," it would have had a bigger audience, <laughs> but it just wasn't as funny. Yeah, yeah, um, and it kind so, of <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so at any rate, that got me thinking, and I started doing some more music videos. You know, all on my own. I create the animation and the, and the film and everything else and the songs and produce it all by myself. And at one point, I thought, well, this is attracting attention and there's a lot of people that like to get their information this way rather than reading the 700 page books yeah yeah so i thought why don't i create a full-length movie yeah. and uh i did, did you and took experience at the time when you started did you have any film experience mm, not really i did a little bit of uh video and animation for my one-man show pigeonholes that i did uh, about 15 years ago and then uh i really didn't get into it i mean back then it wasn't even the, I don't even think we had iPhones to do it on, you know. So, so I was using uh, actual, um, what do you call it, the mini VD tapes or DV tapes. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
the quality was not nearly as good as a regular iPhone now. Yeah. Um, but once I started uh, about uh, a few years ago with, with the music videos, then I just picked it up on my own. And I always, like I started to want to be a, an animator in the beginning. Now it's become easier to do it with computers and all that. Um, so I just jumped into it and uh, created this hour and a half long uh, epic. <laughs> and I said, I'm just, I'm just going to go for it. And I, it, I worked on it seven days a week for 12, what am I saying, 12 hours a day for about three years. Really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. It was, <laughs> and, oh, and it was. No help. What's that? No, no help. help. Wow. The only thing on there that's, of course, there are news clips. I didn't create the news clips. I had to uh, uh, find those and, you know, edit them in and all that. Yeah. Um, but there's one song that has a saxophone solo in it. That's not me. Oh, okay. That's a friend of mine who I uh, knew from back in San Diego, who's uh, an incredible sax player. And he, uh, I made it look as though um, uh, Bill Clinton was playing the sax. <laughs> which, yeah, I love that. And, and the, uh, the bubbles coming up and the smoke, you know. Um, so, you know, then I started, once I got it finished, I, I started entering it in film festivals. Mm -hmm. And um, it started actually, you know, getting a, to be official selections here and there and, and even winning some awards. And I thought, wow, this is cool. And so I have the DVD for sale with a complimentary 17 song uh, CD with the whole soundtrack, plus the lyrics in a, in a booklet. And I sell that when I can, you know, autographed. Yeah. Uh, but if anybody wants to see it free, it's also on YouTube because I think the message is more important than trying to make a living off of it. Awesome. Yeah, I, I was very impressed by that. I was like, oh, we watch this movie for free. Please just share it. And I was like, okay, we'll see if I like it, even if I want to share it. But yeah. no, I was very pleasantly surprised. I immediately announced to all my Facebook friends, please go check this out. Send it to my boyfriend. Please watch this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. You're the one. <laughs> but it was it was fabulous to be able to hear all these very difficult topics that are hard to talk about and, and I get what you're saying I think you've probably been like me where you really care about social issues uh, ever since I was a little kid my mom would say that I, I like to stick up for the underdog and for mm -hmm. the hurting guy uh, and I think we all would like to you know help more but you you figure how could you possibly do that and, and I see where you're coming from as well that life is changing so much to the point where uh, very soon, we could all, you know, end up being the slaves of the government, of the state, and, and that's not mm -hmm. where we want to be. Um, yeah. So when you created this, what was the feedback you got when it first came out? Did you say it was huge or? Well, um, I went to a few of the, um, of the uh, film festivals. You know, I couldn't go to all of them because that would be very expensive. They're all over the country. Yeah. Um, but the reaction was incredible. I mean, uh, we didn't always get a big crowd. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes you never know what's going to happen. Just because you're selected doesn't mean they're going to do a great job. In fact, uh, uh, one of them I went to, they put it on at 12 o'clock. Everybody was out to lunch. Whoa. You know? <laughs> uh, another one I went to in Orlando. Um, hmm. And that was, that was <laughs> kind of interesting. They had the sound so distorted that for the first three or four minutes, you couldn't tell what the people on the screen were saying. Wow. So I had to... I had to run out and, you know, get the projection. I don't know. This is kind of something you, you have no control over what they're going to do when, when you see that. Mm -hmm. But the people who did see it, uh, some of them, the ones that I went to, they have like a Q&A right after the film. And uh, the amazing thing about it was there were a lot of people mm -hmm. who were not uh, conservative or uh, conspiracy theorists mm -hmm. or libertarians, you know. Yeah. They were um, just mainstream straight ahead some of them liberal some of them mm -hmm. you know totally uh, apathetic <laughs> yeah. and and they they said they were amazed they yeah. were amazed because it was presented in a way that they would sit through it mm -hmm. and they couldn't believe some of the stuff they saw like mm -hmm. some of the headlines about the UN and things like that from mainstream news as well as alternative news yeah and uh, they were shocked and they were asking me, what could we do to help? You know, and mm -hmm. I was saying, get the word out, you know, just, uh, that's what we got to do. We got to educate people. 
I think that's where it starts with education because before, like I told you before the interview got started, I really wasn't too heavily or at all into politics really before this last election hit. And then it seemed like everyone got super political this past election season and yeah. had a very, very strong opinion. I really try to keep my opinion out of it because really I didn't want to lose friends or coworkers <laughs> and all that. Um, yeah. But I was, I was very hurt by all of the animosity I saw and that's kind of how mm -hmm. this whole segment came to be. I just wanted to find a way that people can come together and stop fighting and and really discover what's really going on and then really what actions can we really take to go forward to make things better right, mm -hmm. right. yeah I, I'm a firm believer you know I I grew up as uh, as a liberal Democrat you know coming from New York Brooklyn um, that's easy to do <laughs> <laughs> and we were right <laughs> you know there's yeah. no two ways about it. conservatives Republicans mm -hmm. um, they were they were all just weird <laughs> So yeah. I know I know what the other side thinks like and I didn't turn out to be a conservative either uh, Probably a lot of my views are libertarian some of them conservative, but My main philosophy is that when you keep harping on the differences between the two groups mm -hmm. and getting into Arguments. No, I'm right. No, I'm right. You're crazy. No, you're crazy <laughs> All you're doing is reinforcing the differences and separating people mm -hmm. and that way the third party over here, the elite, who want us fighting with each other, they're over there laughing yeah, because no. we're not looking at them. Yeah, they're like, we're winning. Woohoo! They're fighting each other. Conquer and divide. The old exactly. conquer and divide. Yeah. Exactly. And they, they just love it when we fight each other. So I don't even label myself as conservative or libertarian or anything like that. I just, and when I speak to somebody who's got very different views than me, uh, I do it in a way that doesn't make them wrong, but just invites them to look at some other data. Yeah. If you, if you can do that without making somebody wrong and keep the, the affinity level as high as you can, yeah. they, they'll listen to it because as soon as you do anything to make them wrong, then they get, the guard goes up and they're going to be backed into a mm -hmm. corner and they're going to start defending themselves. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't solve anything you're not yeah. gonna so what if you prove yourself right with a million facts it, they're not gonna go away thinking you're right anyway so yeah. that's that's my whole philosophy and that's the philosophy behind the film it's it's nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. it uh it takes swipes at both <laughs> both parties yeah. and um but it's mainly about the new world order the elites the um uh you know the rockefellers the rothschilds the um, uh the people who are um in the pockets of those kind of people yeah and uh, what we can do about it, you know, how we can get back to, uh, to the basic constitution. Yeah, basically where the people, and I mean the people of the entire United States, get to run the, pub, uh, run the government and the country and not a few elitists. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, go. I feel no, like- No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I was gonna say, through all of your research and creating this wonderful film, what was kind of the biggest takeaway for you? Was there one big thing you learned or, or kind of got deeper understanding of after the film that you didn't know beforehand? Well, actually, because it took so long, you know, three years, uh, and I had, to, um, I had to do research every single day because the first thing I had to do was think about which topic I'm gonna to present in which song because there are a lot of topics out there. You know, you can talk about GMOs, chemtrails, uh, the Federal Reserve, vaccines, uh, you know, any, the international bankers in general. Um, uh, boy, there's so many things you could talk about. I had to figure out what can I do successfully in a song? Mm -hmm. And so that was my first thing. So I had to look at things that also wouldn't be dated by the time the film was done. You know, if I use something that was like a headline, Obama says blah, blah, or Clinton does so-and-so. Well, when the film comes out, that's, that's old news, you know? Mm -hmm. So I had to be aware of that. Um, and then I, I, I was learning stuff day to day, you know? And also, I didn't want to depress people too much. I had to, I had, to have some stuff in there that was funny. Um, and there is some stuff that's very depressing as well, because it's serious. Um, but I wanted to keep it as a, an emotional roller coaster, you know, hit them with some serious stuff because there is some very serious stuff out there that we have to know about. Do it in a way they can have it. And then the next song lightens up, gets a little funny, but also gets some points across. Yeah. And, and the main thing is also, I wanted to at least leave them uh, with hope. 
Yes. You know, you could, I, I, when I was learning this stuff myself, I mean, you, you can get to the point where you just want to slit your wrist and say, there's no hope. You know, let's get a, let's just quit, you know? Yeah. So I wanted to give them hope that by the end of the film, if anybody makes it to the end, I want them to feel, hey, yeah, there is hope. We can do something. So that's what I had in mind while I was researching. And every, you know, it would take about a month per song, give or take. And um, I would be looking at all kinds of uh, headlines and stories. And I'd watch Alex Jones and, I, and then the Drudge Report and CNN, Fox News and uh, read books. And from doing that, I had to, number one, cull it all together and figure out what I could do successfully as a song. And number two, find out how not to get deathly ill by, by reading and watching all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was like an ongoing thing. It wasn't like by the end of the film, I knew one thing in particular, you know, yeah. just, just kept learning. Yeah, I, I can see. And it is an ever, a, a complete evolution of a journey of learning. It's never like you, bam, you've got it all. And yeah. I think the one takeaway for me over the past two years or so, seeing this all progress out and, and the elections come to be, is that uh, I really, my greatest hope for people is that they come together and stop seeing the divide. Because when I really sit down with people and talk about all sorts of issues, whether it be government, you know, what's going on with the money situation, I find that everyone are, are very concerned about these things and they really genuinely want to have a successful life. They want to be free. They want their kids to have, be prosperous and have the best life possible. And, to, mm -hmm. you know, we all really want the same thing. And when we talk yeah. deeply about these subjects, we really aren't all that different. I mean, mm -hmm. really, it's all these little names that you said that kind of tear us apart. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, a, a, what do you call them, um, liberal, conservative, whatever, uh, Republican, Democrat, I say, hey, just throw out the party and look at the person. You know, yeah, whenever yeah. you're going to vote or whenever you're going to talk to someone, don't say, I'm a diehard liberal, diehard conservative, whatever. Mm -hmm. Just say, hey, I, I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an American who mm -hmm. wants this country to do better and I want to do better. And, you know, look at it from that perspective. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you know what really pulled my heartstrings? Um, your open letter. Beautiful. Oh, thank you. Uh, and, and the one about a child having autism, or at least that's what it seemed to me, that she had autism. Yeah. I worked in my 20s with a, a school that, um, of children with autism. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard that, I was like, wow. Why did you come to writing that song? What, what brought that about for you? Well, yeah, a lot of people think because of the way I did that mm -hmm. film, because that's, I appear in just a few of the songs. I really don't, uh, I didn't want to make it a... Um, promotional video for me but there were a few songs where I had to appear in them that was one of them and because of that a lot of people think it's it happened to me it happened to my kid I don't have kids I've been married 47 years and as far as I know I don't have kids I'm pretty sure <laughs> um, unless they're just very quiet I don't know <laughs> but um, I was just it was just one of those things I was learning about um, you know the the autism rate it's alarming when you think about it. It's, it went from one in 10,000 to one in 45. And that rise in autism parallels the rise in vaccines. Now, people will argue, well, that's not proof. Fine. You, it's not proof, but it, you better damn well look into it. Yeah. This is, this is too, too much of a coincidence, you know? And when you're talking about one in 45 kids with autism, that's, that should be major headlines. That is, talk about, you know, people are always walking, well, flu broke out in Disneyland this year. Mm -hmm. What, they have like nine cases of flu, and I think they were from people who got the flu shot. Yeah. <laughs> they got the vaccine. Yeah. So anyway, <clears throat> and, and I, I heard something, I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard some prediction that by 2030, there's going to be one in two kids that have autism. Wow. This is insane. No, it is. It's, and so I... I started reading about it and listen, listening to stories, and I ran across a lot of stories of people who, who they, they brought their kid in for the vaccines shots, well, all the shots, and either right after <clears throat> or days after, the kid got autistic symptoms and, or, or went into shock or just wasn't there anymore, just total blank, you know? This is, there's too many stories like this, and they need to be researched, and uh, I presented the song, it's called My Daughter Sleeps. I presented that as a story, a true story. Mm -hmm. And uh, not as like, here's proof that vaccines mm -hmm. create autism, but this is a true story. And after I put that song out, I heard from a lot of people who told me my nephew has that, it happened to my nephew, it happened to my kid. 
uh, it's just happening all over the place and, and it needs to be looked into. And I don't care how irate people get saying, you're conspiracy theorists, Vac vaccines are the greatest thing that ever happened. They got rid of polio, <laughs> you know, which they didn't if you look into that. Yeah. But um, it needs to be looked into. One out of 45 now is absolutely insane. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally get you. Last year we had a, a guest come on talk about her child. She wrote a book about her um, child being vaccine harmed, as she called it. I was curious, and I, it just blew me away. Uh, I had no idea that, for one, infants are getting so many vaccines on top of each other. Uh, when I was a kid, I didn't get that many at once. I, I mean, yeah. I'm now 48, and we didn't get that many. And so, at the very least, it could be just how many we're getting at once. I mean, it's a little child, a little body that's got to mm -hmm. take it and process all of these chemicals. So, I mean, it's not outrageous to think or for parents to say, hey, this is happening. My kid got hurt. Let's look into this. And yeah. I really think the public should be outraged or, or at least demand that this be looked into and really looked into. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're playing Russian roulette with your kid's life, you know? You, you shouldn't just yeah. take that in stride. I mean, I think they're getting something like 30 some odd shots at one time now or something like that. That was 40, but hey, 40, 30, I, so I, I, don't, I don't have, the, I don't have the latest, but I mean, and the, some of the shots include mercury, formaldehyde, um, fluoride, uh, all poisons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As preservatives. <laughs> and, and think about this for a minute. The, the vaccine companies, big pharma, mm -hmm. it's, they're the only company they, they got the government to create something called a vaccine court. Mm -hmm. This is so that if anybody sues the vaccine companies, it'll be secret. Okay. Whatever the outcome is, it'll be behind closed doors, so there will be no bad publicity for vaccines. That's crazy. Wow. Why would they do that? Think about that. Unless there was something to hide. There's something very big to hide. And, wow. and they're, they're, so whenever somebody wins a big lawsuit, you don't know about it. Um, mm -hmm. That's insane. That's the, that's the revolving door thing between big pharma and the government. You know, yeah, the yeah. FDA. That, that's a big one. Now, coming across all of this, I mean, has there been one thing that you think that is a big danger to this country and its freedom and liberties that needs to be looked at by every person and researched? If there's, do you think there's like one aspect or a number of aspects? Boy, there's so many. You know, for one thing, public schools are really indoctrination centers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. That's... You know, if I had a kid, I would definitely homeschool him. I, I know that's not easy, but I, I don't know the, if, if I was to look at one thing, I would think that the, uh, the banking system um, mm -hmm. in 19, what was it, 19? 13. I should, yeah, I should know this. It's the lyrics in one of my songs. Yes, I remember it. <laughs> yeah. um, they had a secret meeting, the bankers, international bankers. These are not even total, uh, you know, uh, United States banking companies. They had a secret meeting on Jekyll Island. To, uh, to create a central bank for the government. Mm -hmm. Now, in our constitution, it says the Congress shall coin our money. Mm -hmm. That would mean we would have control of what our money is and how much it's worth and everything else. So these, these bankers, they, number one, they got um, a pres President Wilson elected who was, he wanted a central bank. He, they knew he was going to be friendly to them. Mm -hmm. And they had this, this meeting to create a central bank, call it the Federal Reserve, so it'll fool people into thinking it's part of the government. It's not federal and there's no reserves. It's private bankers. Mm -hmm. They just, just like Joe's Pizza, you know, I mean. <laughs> and, and they got the government to hand over our ability to create money to these private banks. Mm. So now here's the scam. This is the biggest scam in the history of the country, if not the world. Mm. They now, these privately owned banks, can print money at will mm -hmm. and loan it to the U.S. government. And then we have to pay back the loan and the interest. Mm. So they create money out of thin air and yeah. then loan it to us. And we have to pay it back with the interest. All of your income tax. Mm -hmm. the, in fact, the income tax was created the same year for the purpose of paying back the interest on the loan to the bankers. Yeah. Biggest scam there is. And, and since they, they came into power claiming that they would make the dollar stable, mm. well, the, the dollar has lost 96% of its value since the Federal Reserve came into being. 
Yeah, and just to break that out a little bit more, to lose 96% of its value means it's, it's only worth, what, four pennies on the dollar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and frankly, it's worth whatever they decide it's worth because if they want to print more, it's worth even less. Mm -hmm. You know, they decide if they want to create, they create recessions and depressions when they want, at will. Mm -hmm. It's scientifically created so that they can, you know, uh, make the value go down and make the stock market go up and down when they want. Uh, and some of the banks are not even American banks, they're international banks. And they, they've got us by the neck. Mm -hmm. And, and if, we, if we got rid of, like Ron Paul wants to, uh, and Rand Paul too, they, to audit the Fed, that's the first step. They, the thing is, we can't even audit them. We can't even, the president can't sit in on their meetings. They are total. They do whatever the hell they want. Excuse it, my friend. It's almost like we we've, we've sold out our country to these uh, international um, elite bankers, and it's scary because when we started out before 1913, before um, with Wildrow Wilson signed over that wonderful bill that's now enslaved us all yeah. and the world, um, because whatever happens here happens across the entire globe. Um, mm -hmm. That. You know, now our um, beforehand we had sound money, which means it was backed by gold or silver. Right now, now and then I don't know. I think it was 1936 or so. Uh, the government now said you can't have or buy gold, gold and silver as a citizen because they mm -hmm. were trying to take that away from the, the people. So, uh, do you think there's a way we could ever get to a sound money system where we could, could get back the control in the people without having to audit them, but just eliminate them somehow? Well. You know, finance is, a, is another area I'm a total moron <laughs> about. However, I'm starting to look into um, um, cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting, you know, like Bitcoin and, and the yeah. others. Um, I don't own any yet, but uh, I'm, I'm going to start. I'm looking into it more now. And the thing I like best about it, and of course, you know, anytime you invest in the stock market or anything else, it's, it's, uh, it's a risk. Mm -hmm. But... Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies are actually less risky than a paper dollar mm. because that paper dollar and the stock market is, is totally controlled by the Federal Reserve mm -hmm. and the elite bankers. Yeah. So they've got you by the neck. Now, Bitcoin, I can't go into the whole um, yeah. philosophy. I'm still learning about it. But people ought to look into that because that takes it out of the hands of the bankers. It just bypasses bankers altogether, puts it into the hands of the people. And I, I think that has a lot of promise to, to start getting rid of uh, these uh, crooks. Yeah, yeah. We have an upcoming show coming out uh, where a guy wrote a book uh, more deeply into the subject of of the Federal Reserve and all of that. And uh, mm -hmm. I suggest everyone read up on it and, and discover more about them because, yeah. I mean, I think when people say, "Well, it doesn't affect me in my everyday life," I'm like, "Oh, but it does. It very oh. much does." Because if they decide, "Hey, we're going to raise the interest and we're going to print more money and throw it out there," and it will because then things the value of things go up because you know mm -hmm. now there's more money floating around so everything that they do do with money and the value of it does affect everyone here and all over the globe sure looks look yeah. what's happening in, in venezuela oh. uh you know or uh, what happened in greece i mean um and overnight mm -hmm. they could close the doors to the banks you can't get your money out mm -hmm. overnight a loaf of bread could cost a thousand dollars Mm -hmm. You know, so your money, I mean, it's just, it's just a fairy tale thinking that your money is safe and it's, yeah. it doesn't concern you. Um, if you're not worried about money, more power to you. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you've got a stack of gold somewhere. I, I know I don't. Yeah. But um, I think you ought to worry about the, the economy. You know, that's why you got parents, two, two parents have to work all the time now because the value of the money has gone down. Yeah. They, 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 you know... Uh, it's 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 crazy, you know. Um, I'm a bit older than you. Uh, I'll be October fourth. I'll be um, seventy. My God! <laughs> you certainly don't look it. <laughs> Thanks. That's why I said that. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say that. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm amazed, but I've I've seen a lot of things, you know, and and uh, mm -hmm. you better start taking uh, some notice of what's going on in the world because. It's the very fact that you don't that will cause it to become this bad. Yeah. You know, it's like, go ahead. Go ahead. 
Yeah, I was just going to say what happened in Greece. I, I know people in Greece. They were very shocked when their whole finances and the system fell. I mean, I just heard it. They went to the bank and bam, no money's coming out. Right. And right. yeah, and then they actually, I think $20 a day was a limit. And imagine if you have a family to feed. Mm -hmm. so. Exactly. And um, I think people also ought to look into this whole idea of one world government. You know, uh, one of the, um, the groups, I won't. I won't say they're liberals, but they are. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I can talk about this because I was, and I understand the whole head, the head thing about it. Yeah. The idea of getting, doing away with borders mm. will, will uh, do away with war. Mm. You know, nationalism is somehow the enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, being proud of your country is some, some way that uh, that's what causes wars. That's complete BS. Mm -hmm. uh, when, the elites want to control you. Mm. The very first thing they're going to do is try to do away with borders. Mm. Because where are you going to run if they don't like what you think or what you say? Yeah. You see? Yeah. Yeah. And they're going to be controlling the currency, not just of America, but of the entire world. They do away with borders. They have one electronic currency. Mm. And if they don't like the way you think or what you said, they turn off your income. They, yeah. Your money disappears. And as, as I said in another song, which is on a different album, mm. uh, how will you run for the border when there's a new world order? I mean, mm. seriously, yeah. right now, having borders and having countries at least gives you a place where if you're being persecuted one place, you can go to another place. Mm -hmm. But once they do away with borders, forget about it. As yeah. they say in New York, forget about it. Forget about it. Yeah, yeah. In, in Brooklyn, yeah. <laughs> Brooklyn. <laughs> Yo. Yo, but it's true because um, we all have very different ways of being. What's really fantastic about the United States is there's a lot of states that have a different kind of essence and feel and character to them that, hey, if you don't like it in New York, you can move to Texas and get the Texas feel, or you can move mm -hmm. to California and get the California feel. We have a lot of different character and, and, um, and personality in the United States. Yeah. If we were to just turn into one world, we all love each other, we're all the same not all the same. We all have different thoughts and different things that excite us. And we should have different yeah. ways to express ourselves, not just right. one way. The differences are good. Mm -hmm. But when I was growing up, I was taught that one reason for war was nationalism. Mm. And it's, it's not. It's, it's, I love the fact that we're different than the French and the French are different than the Italians. And I've got friends from every nation. And I'm crazy about the fact that they're so different. Yeah. And they love the fact that I'm different. So, um, you know, doing away with borders, it's just insane. And of course, and this, this brings out a whole topic of um, gun control as well. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that, and, and again, you know, this gets a lot of people, um, gets the hairs on the back of their neck sticking up. Uh, and I understand why. But the fact is that when you make it illegal to own a firearm or protect yourself, yeah. then only the criminals will have the guns. Yeah. The criminals in the government, and of course, I'm being redundant. Yes. So, <laughs> but the thing is, the first thing Hitler did, or any dictator did, was outlaw weapons. Mm -hmm. Because you can't protect yourself. You know, it, the government, no matter how big their arsenal is, they cannot protect themselves if every single person had a weapon in their home. Yeah. And the fact is that places where guns are free, like right now there's this whole movement among certain Hollywood people mm. to put signs up, uh, red lights outside the home, declaring their home as gun free. <laughs> My God, if I was a criminal, I'd be looking for those red lights. You know, hey, this is good. Let's, <laughs> they're not going to fight back, you know. Um, but anyway, that's, that's a whole part of it. You know, the yeah. dictators without a, without a doubt would want yeah. an unarmed public. Yeah, I, I do get people when they say, hey, look at all the school shootings and whatever. Now, we did a show last year with a doctor who did a lot of research, and he found something very interesting that a lot of, not a lot of, all but one, he couldn't verify, all but one recent school shooting, they were taking, the ch child who went out shooting, was on right. some psychotropic drugs. Exactly. Exactly. Really extreme drugs for a child to be taking. And then right. they went haywire and they went shooting. Now, I know people are upset about the guns, but hey, I think maybe we should look at that drug thing because maybe that's part of the issue. So, I, I mean, I get where they're upset about guns and they said there'd be less shootings and less people dying. But hey, 
would there really, if all the criminals who don't get them legally would just go get them over the border to go steal them or whatever, right. and then still go shooting up people. So, and then right. you now can't defend yourself. So would you really be safer? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and the thing you brought up about, this is one of my pet peeves too, that I've been studying since the 1990s about uh, psychiatric drugs. Mm. Uh, I didn't go into that very heavily, if, if at all, maybe just a little bit. Yeah, I did. I did actually a little bit in, in the film. Mm. Um, Prozac, for instance, in the 1990s, there were more adverse side effects reported to the FDA than any drug in history. Yet, the FDA passed it. It was okay. It left it on, on, the, uh, on the agenda. Um, if you read the label of, of Zoloff, um, uh, gee, there's so many of these drugs. Yeah, he's getting angry. <laughs> I understand. If you read the label, it says some of the side effects are violence and suicide. Nightmares, violence, and suicide. It's on the label. It causes the things that the psychiatrists are claiming it cures. And every, like you said, almost every one, if not every one of the, of the recent school shooters were on psych drugs or recently taken off and are experiencing the withdrawals. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if you look into every one of these mass shootings, and, and it's not just school shootings, but um, anytime there's somebody that runs into a theater or this or that and is shooting people up, just wait as soon as it be. Well, I think he was off his meds, you know, and that's why he shot it. his meds. His meds are always in there. But the, the news media does not connect the dots that, mm -hmm. hey, his meds turned him into a mass murderer. Because mm -hmm. all of these kids who went in and shot people up, they might have been troubled kids, but they were not murderers until after seeing the psychiatrist and getting put on drugs, these wow. drugs. Wow. That, that's a scary, scary thing. Now, I know um, some people I've talked to will say, well, yeah, but if they didn't have the guns, they still wouldn't have gone shooting people up. I said, no, they could build a pipe bomb in their kitchen. Hello? Right. There's a lot of easy ways to hurt people. Or drive uh, a car into a crowd or whatever. They've been yeah. doing it in France and Europe. Yeah. And, and there's one guy did in Japan who um, hmm. massacred 27 people in a school with a machete or, or a knife or something. Right, uh, right. So, yeah, there's plenty of ways to harm people if you really um, want to. And when I was was growing up you know I went to uh, elementary school in the 50s and high school in the 60s anybody could get a gun if they really wanted to mm -hmm. they were they were tough kids who had knives and guns and you know switchblades and all that they didn't go around shooting and killing everybody it wasn't until the drugs became prevalent mm -hmm. that uh, it screwed with people's minds oh. um, and you know like uh, Timothy Leary the psychologist who who made it uh, uh, a great thing to turn on and drop out turn on tune in and drop out by taking LSD you know, this, this LSD is, was created by the CIA to, to, uh, and psychiatrists mm -hmm. to, to show what it was like to be psychotic, what to, to have a psychotic break. That, wow. that was the original reason for that. And as well, to do some mind control experiments mm -hmm. with MKUltra, yeah, M-K-U-L-T-R-A, which um, is still going on, but more secretive, and they don't call it that anymore. Um, they were actually giving LSD to people without them knowing it. And, uh, uh, these these psychiatrists were working with the CIA to um, to to create a Manchurian candidate with uh, drugs and hypnosis and and uh, torture and things like that. Wow, <laughs> wow. goes go, goes pretty deep. It gets pretty heavy. It certainly does. Now, do you think war or, or soldiers having going to war kind of desensitize you and make it easier for you to go? I mean, I think that could be part of it because. Yeah. Well, you know. Right now, there's more soldiers committing suicide every day than are killed in combat. Mm. And you know why? Mm. They're yeah. being pumped full of these psychiatric drugs. They give them the psych. They give that when they're out. Yeah, wow. yeah, to make them be better soldiers in quotes. Really? To make, yeah, so they don't care so much about killing. Nuts! I didn't know they gave them medication. Yeah. Wow! And, that and and they end up committing suicide or coming home and, and killing people and committing suicide. They are pumped full of these drugs. Wow. Well, that is, wow, that is a big thing to investigate right there alone. There's mm -hmm. so many things, and your film touches on, on so many things. Don't be scared, people. It's a really, <laughs> a lot of funny parts in it. Actually, it's makes, funny. <laughs> very, very funny. Actually, there's a lot of parts that made me smile and laugh, and I'm singing along going, oh, this is really sad stuff behind it. But uh, and it actually, and if anything, if you don't want to go look up the book or whatever, hopefully it will just inspire you to, just go deeper. And, and like I always say to anyone who listens to my show, don't take anything I say or my guests verbatim. Go look it up for yourself and, and research um, because we're in this together and we can yeah. 
can all work together to make this country better. And I just want to thank you, Neil, for coming to share your great gift today on Saturday well, Radio. Thank you. I, I want to thank you for having me on the show. It's, it's been a pleasure. You betcha. Now everyone can go and check out your music and everything at theconspiracyproject.org, right? Dot .org, org, yeah. Cons yeah. Conspiracy Project, not conspiracy, conspiracy Theory. So they can see oh. it on conspiracyproject.org. Yeah, you said it right, but some people switch it around when they hear it. And uh, the other place they can find more about me, which is less conspiratorial, <laughs> is uh, my main website, which is therealneilfox.com. And of course, I have a YouTube channel, uh, which is uh, youtube.com slash Neil F. And they can find me on Facebook and, you know, friend me, yeah. subscribe, do all that wonderful stuff. And get the album. I got it this past weekend after watching the film. It's fabulous. Listening on the way to work. Got to make sure I just don't sing F the Fed on the way to work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what do you say? Uh, but everyone, go to theconspiracyproject.org and get a copy today. Watch the film. And I want to thank you again, Neil, for coming to Savvy Business Radio. My pleasure. Thank you. Here's an excerpt of our interview for next week with Jeff Deal, U.S. Senate candidate in Massachusetts. I always felt that you know America was great because of the um, the fact that we are rugged individuals that uh, really try to um, first of all I think incentivize uh, you know fr the free market incentivizes innovation and it incentivizes hard work and when you take that away and the government just becomes a provider for everything you really create a, a class that's permanently dependent on government services and I think that's dangerous in, in a lot of different ways yeah and I, I can totally speak to how the Health Care Act has really hurt people and not just um, middle class folks well yeah middle class folks and and poor folks as well is my partner's mom is in her 80s and she doesn't make a slew of money but uh, she's now on pension and in her 80s and and um, Social Security and her her ben her um, health care has gone up drastically. I think the premium she says is, is three times higher. And now it's like, do I choose to eat or do I choose to take medicine or go to the doctor? And it shouldn't be in your 80s. You worked your whole life to put into a good life, and then you have to choose: do I take heart medication or do I choose to eat food? I mean that that it's terrible. Yeah, and so it's, it's terrible. Completely not affordable. <laughs> and it's no, but you know, it, whenever government becomes a buyer of a service, the prices automatically go up because it's a guaranteed payer. So when you have health care, government involved in purchasing health care, of course, the costs just go astronomically up higher. Same thing with education. I mean, again, Elizabeth Warren is all about, you know, free, free college education for kids. She's trying to take over the the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democrat Party. Well, guess what? Free college education means that the government's paying. And if the government pays, these colleges are just going to continue to increase the cost with no accountability because, again, and that's just exactly what we're seeing now. College tuitions risen completely out of control. It, it goes back to um, the housing market crisis, which, you know, everything broke down. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were being required by the federal government to uh, uh, service um, subprime lending and uh, you know when when they were forced to give loans to, to people who probably shouldn't have had them uh, that created all the derivatives that were based on really junk bond uh, 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 loans and so uh, that really kind of created the meltdown at an accelerated pace uh, again whenever government thinks that they know they can do things better I, I tend to disagree I think government is a decent referee but it's really the free market that does a, a better job of competing and, and creating all the new products and services that make our lives better it's interesting because I've heard people mention the free market equals businesses are greedy and just want to take money from people. And I'm like, no, it means that anyone, <laughs> even a small business owner like myself, because I am a small business owner, can have the ability and the freedom to go out there and build a business. And, and, and thanks to the online um, opportunities out here, thing, hopefully the new, neutrality act they're trying to pass doesn't come to a point where we can't do business online. But this has allowed people access to build businesses in ways you couldn't do before and, and, and to start to thrive on your own without having to be connected. Not everyone wants to go to a job or a nine to five. It allows you also opportunity to go to your local coffee shop instead of going to a big Starbucks or such. So um, uh, small business is great and so is the free market. I think people get confused thinking that if the government just takes care of things, it'll be better. But I think what they have to look at is that the government can't do anything without your tax paying money. So if you don't want to pay taxes, <laughs> or you want all these benefits, it can't. you can't have one without the other. If you're going to get the benefits, you're going to get taxed more. Well, I, this, this to me really is the, the crux of, of the argument with Elizabeth Warren, where she talked when she first ran for office about the fact that uh, it was government that provided the roads. She famously said, you didn't build that. It was government that allowed you to create your, your small business or your company. And I have to laugh because she said it in Massachusetts, a state 
first of all, where the pilgrims founded our country, but secondly, where it was the Lowell textile mills. It was the gun companies in the central Massachusetts. It was the fishing industry, uh, the whaling industry down in New Bedford that built the hospitals that built the private schools because public schools weren't invented until Horace Greeley, a uh, state legislator in Massachusetts, invented them. Uh, it was the private enterprise that provided all of those public programs like, like again, hospitals and schools and built the roads. She completely has her history backwards and, and continues to villainize you know, corporations in Wall Street. By the way, Wall Street, where we happen to have all of our, you know, investments. I mean, you know, everybody's retirement is tied into Wall Street, and she wants to somehow basically just scrap Wall Street altogether if she could. Uh, we're talking about a senator who uh, wants to be reelected in Massachusetts, uh, but wants to spend the next two years in office running for president of the United States. And I think here in Massachusetts, the the vibe that I've felt going around the state uh, during my exploratory committee has been uh, one that they feel like she hasn't done anything for our state, which is provable by uh, getting nothing passed to, to help our state. But secondly, um, the, uh, she, she talks uh, completely about, uh, you know, the national issues and not about the state issues that are important to us. She's an obstructionist to the Trump agenda as far as all of his nominees uh, for his cabinet. Um, and, and the other thing I'll, I'll leave you with, too, is that we used to have Ted Kennedy as our senior senator, and he was, you know, no friend of Republicans. He was a, a big partisan. Uh, he was called the liberal lion of the Senate. But Ted Kennedy knew that when elections were over, it was time to work with Republican presidents and Republican governors to get things done for the people of Massachusetts and of this country. And uh, that's why, again, for me, uh, with a track record of success I've had up on Beacon Hill, I believe I can challenge effectively Elizabeth Warren in Massachusetts and, and redirect the conversation in D.C. against the partisanship, against dividing Americans uh, against themselves, and more towards growth and, uh, and healthy competition ex externally with countries that right now are eating our lunch as far as China, you know, in certain um, manufacturing, uh, Russia as far as oil. And we really need to get our act together uh, internally in this country so we can start to uh, have that dominant presence in the, in the national, uh, international scene again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I see all of the people who are obstructing in the Senate and the Congress really being obstruction not to the people they don't like on the opposite side, but to the actual people of the United States of America. They, have, they are obstructing liberty and, and our voice. We voted and we demand that, you know, our, we are safe, that we have affordable, you know, health care and really affordable health care, not one that we really can't afford, that, you know, that we really have a structure and that our voices are really being heard and they are stopping that. So I I see them a front to every single American as well as liberty. And uh, I, I thank you, Jeff, for being the, the few out there standing against that. Now, to speak to the audience a little bit about, I saw that um, George Soros Super PAC uh, had been tracking you and as you were going about doing your campaign and illegally recording you. I just started to learn a little bit about um, Super PACs and such. Didn't know anything about that. I'm sure a lot, of my, a lot of people in my audience don't understand about that. Share a little bit about the dirty stuff that goes on behind the scenes that all of us might not be aware of. Well, that's the kind of sad thing that goes on in American politics nowadays. I, you know, growing up again, I always respected the people who served in office. I always thought uh, it was just amazing to even be able to meet them or talk to them. Nowadays, um, it seems like with social media, you know, on Facebook or Twitter, people can just randomly attack uh, people who have basically dedicated their lives towards public service and towards trying to make other people's lives better. And that's bad. But actually, when you're running for office, you know, I didn't think that it was as dirty pool as it is. Uh, but I ended up finding out firsthand just this last uh, few weeks, uh, I've been, again, doing this exploratory committee. And, and by the way, there is a website, dealforsenate.com, D-I-E-H-L-F-O-R, senate.com, where you can learn more about me as a candidate, the policies I have, and uh, just, just generally uh, links to Facebook and news stories. But also, um, this story you know, came out of the, the Boston Herald, where they actually tracked down um, the trackers. They call them trackers, people who go to your political events. Uh, so for me, I was going to uh, Republican town meetings. I was going to uh, uh, fundraising events that I had set up to uh, for this exploratory committee. And what was happening was George Soros has funded a super PAC called American Bridge 21st Century. And that uh, that group basically hires people to go and videotape and uh, and record Republican candidates to try to uh, bring them, you know, basically get gather evidence that can be used against them down the roads. Mm -hmm. So if you accidentally say something, you know, informally or on camera that could be used as damaging material, that's that's what's happening. And so this is paid for by 
uh, a super PAC or paid for by George Soros to a super PAC. And then they, they uh, you know, they're not supposed to collude with candidates, but they probably create attack ads that are then used against you. And again, it was very startling, but was even more startling was uh, there was a, a time where I, I had just finished speaking. I sat down to the table and a woman sat down next to me saying that she had just missed my speech and uh, she had come from Maine. She was a new new uh, citizen or new resident of Massachusetts. And could I could I go over a few questions she had? So she started asking me some questions, hmm. and uh, and then she got up, walked away, and sat down um, next to another person who had a, a large camera. It turns out the camera was a video type camera as well, and that person was recording this person uh, speaking after me uh, at my event, and. Um, I went back over to the woman that originally talked to me and I said, are you a reporter? And she said, no, 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 I'm just uh, somebody who's, you know, we're, we're just getting information for people who couldn't make it to the meeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, did you, did you just record me? And, and cause I noticed that she was holding kind of trying to keep it sort of hidden uh, mm -hmm. her, her cell phone. And she said, well, actually I did. And I said, well, it's illegal in Massachusetts to record somebody uh, a private conversation without having notified the other person. And she said, Oh, okay, uh, I'll delete it then. And so she actually did delete it in front of me, I hope. Uh, but uh, I mean, I, I saw her press the delete buttons. I hope it wasn't taken out of the trash. But, you know, that's, again, when you run for office and you're, you're trying to think of, you know, good policy and helping people, it's really disturbing sometimes to think that people go to such measures to try to gather um, negative information about you. Yeah, and it's, I'm glad you mentioned it's illegal in Boston. Here in New York, I believe as, as long as one party knows, it's okay. But it's different in every state, so you have to, you know, find out what your state laws are before you start doing stuff like that. And I think it's always good courtesy just to let the person know you're recording them. And you know, it's sad though because it's not just them taking something you might have said by accident. What I've noticed, and I've actually been recorded by, um, I think it was the Daily News in my 20s, is they often will take a piece of what you said and skew it around to mean something different. And that's something exactly. Yeah, that's something the mainstream media does often, and it's kind of sad because that's not at all what I said. <laughs> and so I think that's kind of made politics very, very dirty. What can people be made aware of when they go to vote uh, in November for you know whatever state they're in? How to become aware of who's telling the truth? What information is valid information? Do you have any maybe tips for audience on how they can be a well-informed voter? Well, you know, it used to be back in the day, you'd say, go to your, your, uh, you know, go to one of your trusted news sources. But, but even today now, you wonder about, you know, groups like even CNN, you start to say, is this really fake news? But, you know, I mean, that's the problem nowadays. I think a lot of media has been shaped so much uh, one side or the other that it's hard to tell. And then in comes social media kind of sweeping in and there's people putting stories out there that other people think is real and, uh, and they may trust those sources. It's, it's very tough. What I, what I would say is, First, go to the horse's mouth. If you're really curious about what how a candidate stands on a certain issue, no better way than to meet them. And, and they're, while people may think that candidates are out of touch, that's really not true. Candidates, are, like myself, are always uh, attending events, uh, public events, or uh, setting up events. Uh, I have town hall meetings in my district. I have uh, you know campaign events that I set up. Anybody can go to those, and anybody can come up to the candidate and speak to them. Uh, that's the first thing. And then if they're not available, somebody from the campaign can also talk to them as well. Uh, the other thing, too, is look up their voting records. Don't get lazy and trust that somebody else just told you that somebody voted for this when maybe they didn't. Uh, there is ways to look at your state legislator's uh, voting record by uh, going. Usually most states um, now have, and the federal government has a record of tracking uh, votes on bills. So you can check those things out. Um, that's, that's another way to do it. And then, uh, if you really are interested in getting involved in campaigns yourself, then you can join local, uh, town committees, either Democrat or Republican and get involved. And usually that's where a, a lot of things get discussed as to voting records of. After five years of creating exciting business content with amazing businesses from around the world, Savvy is now creating a new video series entitled Heartbeat of the World. This series will feature experts from around the globe. We will highlight and discuss some of the greatest challenges facing the U.S. and the world. Co-create with us and find out more at bit.ly slash Savvy Patron. Savvy Business Radio and runs in syndication on eight AM FM stations nationwide, including iHeartRadio and six podcasting platforms. To find out about our paid sponsorship opportunities or to become a guest and find out how we can help you get your message out in a bigger way, call 732 
1-800-474-7375 or email Christina at SavvyBusinessRadio.com. Politicians come and go, the smell is in the air. Whether right or left, the wind may blow, there's one thing they all share. Say whatever fits the mood 